Hello and welcome to this critical care teaching video covering the basics of intracranial physiology. Today we're going to take a look at two main areas. The first is the autoregulation or regulation of cerebral blood flow and then we'll look at the Munro Kelly doctrine. These principles are really important to get clear in your mind before we start talking about the management of traumatic brain injury and raised intracranial pressure within the critical care unit. Cerebral blood flow then is autoregulated. Autoregulation is the ability of an organ, in this case the brain, to maintain constant blood flow across a wide range of blood pressures. But cerebral blood flow also varies with oxygen and carbon dioxide tensions. And finally, it's linked very closely with cerebral metabolic rate. This is so-called flow metabolism coupling. So if we look at this in graphical form then, cerebral blood flow versus mean arterial pressure, you can see that the cerebral blood flow is kept constant at approximately 50 mils per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute across a wide range of mean arterial pressure, typically quoted in most books as being between 50 and 150 millimeters of mercury. But this curve can shift. Chronic, poorly controlled hypertension can lead to the whole curve shifting to the right. And so blood flow regulation will occur at considerably higher pressures than we may be expecting. Cerebral blood flow is also autoregulated versus oxygen tension within the blood. PaO2 values of 8 kilopascals or less will lead to the brain crying out for more oxygen and therefore increasing cerebral blood flow. This is why it's critically important to avoid hypoxemia in patients with traumatic brain injury. When we look at cerebral blood flow versus carbon dioxide, it's very much a relationship of direct proportion. At high arterial carbon dioxide tensions, blood vessels dilate and therefore cerebral blood flow increases up until approximately 10 kilopascals where blood vessels are maximally dilated. Likewise, when arterial carbon dioxide tension is low, blood vessels constrict and therefore blood flow reduces down to approximately two, two and a half kilopascals, at which point the blood vessels cannot constrict anymore. Again, that curve can be shifted in cases of chronic hypercapnia, such as patients with severe COPD. Cerebral blood flow is also very closely linked with the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. Now in health, that's typically around 3.3 mils of oxygen for every 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. And at that level of uh, CMRO2, cerebral blood flow is approximately 50 mils per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. But you can see if the brain is needing more oxygen for any particular reason, such as, for example, seizures, cerebral blood flow increases to deliver that extra oxygen to the brain. Likewise, if the cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen decreases, such as under anesthesia or deep sedation, the cerebral blood flow will reduce in kind. The Munro Kelly doctrine then. The key to getting your head around this is that your brain exists inside a box. That box, the skull, is rigid and non-expandable. Within it, in health, about 85% of its contents are brain tissue with about 10% cerebral spinal fluid or CSF and about 5% blood and each of those components contributes to your intracranial pressure, your ICP. The Munro-Kelly doctrine, or sometimes called the Munro-Kelly hypothesis, or principle, is that for the volume of one of these components to increase without having an effect on the intracranial pressure, the volume of one or both of the other components must decrease. Brain tissue volume will increase in cases of tumour or perhaps edema following a stroke. Blood volume will increase due to vasodilatation, as per the graphs we looked at earlier, or obstruction of venous outflow, or indeed bleeding within and or outside of the brain itself. 
cerebral spinal fluid volume will increase if there's excess production, decreased absorption, or indeed an obstructed circulation of CSF. Compensation does occur to a degree. Tissue volume, though, is relatively restricted in its ability to undergo change, whereas CSF and blood volume are best able to compensate. Initial small rises in intracranial pressure are buffered by the movement of CSF into the spinal subarachnoid space and increased reabsorption of that CSF. The blood volume is relatively low within the head and is mostly contained within a low pressure venous system, tightly controlled by autoregulation. But if tissue volume is increasing after CSF is moved out of this, this, the cranial vault, blood can be pushed out as well. Looking at this in graphical form then, between points A and B on the graph, as the units of volume within the head increase, the ICP varies very little. The head is, the brain is able to compensate very well here. But between B and C, as the units of volume continue to increase, we start seeing a rise in intracranial pressure. The compensatory mechanisms are now failing and we are seeing focal ischemia because not just the CSF has been forced out, but blood is now being forced out, and that is leading to ischemia of brain tissue. Between C and D, we see a completely decompensated state, where that situation within the head is getting so bad that there is now global ischemia affecting the whole brain. There are many factors that affect compliance. The amount of volume increase, clearly, also the time frame for accommodation. An acute bleed has very little time to for the brain to compensate versus a very slow growing tumour where the brain can learn to adapt. The size of the intracranial compartments also matters too. We know that brain tissue atrophies with multiple factors, including age, alcohol and previous traumatic brain injury. So today we briefly looked at the very basics of intracranial physiology and the regulation of cerebral blood flow, and we've touched upon the Munro Kelly Doctrine. These principles are absolutely key to understanding the management of traumatic brain injury and other neurocritical care scenarios. If you do have any questions about this talk, please leave them down in the comments below, and I hope to see you with the next one.